Okay, good afternoon, DevOx. It's so great to see so many of you here. So very welcome to this talk. My name is Hanno, and I would like to talk to you this afternoon about concurrency in Java. And we'll ha we will have plenty of time. As you know, this is a deep dive session. It will run until 4.30, so if that's too long for your taste, you can still run out now if you want. Um, I'll try to keep it a bit lighthearted, not too heavy. Um, and also, we'll, we will be taking a much-needed break right in the middle of this talk, right? right? So I'll try to talk about an hour, maybe an hour, 10 minutes, and then we'll have a nice long break of 30 minutes. And then I'll pick it up where we left off and um, deliver the remainder of the talk. And because this is such a long session, please feel free to ask any questions in between, right? There's plenty of time for that. So I'll, uh, I'll repeat the question for everyone else to hear, and uh, feel free to interrupt me, right? There's, there's plenty of time to do that. So like I said, I want to talk about Java's concurrency features, like you already read in the abstract, probably. Um, concurrency in Java has quite a long history. It started back in the 90s, and the support for concurrency has steadily improved over time. And lots of stuff is actually happening in Java's latest releases. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give this talk to you. Uh, it's a topic that has always interested me, concurrency in Java. Uh, but it has also scared me a bit from time to time. Lots of things are possible with it, but also lots of things are not. And the reason it's, it's scary to me, well, there are multiple reasons, um, but one of them is in order to do your job as a Java developer, in general, you don't really need the intricate knowledge of concurrency. You're probably working with an application framework, right? Spring or Jakarta EE or Quarkus or something else, and that will handle most of the concurrency issues for you. So I think that's one of the reasons why people don't really get, generally don't get to work with concurrency features directly. But this is a very good place to start changing that. Right? And I said generally, because when you're a, a library developer, of course, you are dealing with concurrency. You're dealing with threats. Uh, or if you're working, for example, as a, a consultant for a client project, and, you, and there's that fateful day that you run into a race condition, then you need to have that intricate knowledge of concurrency in Java. Um, so. In general, you don't need to know everything about it unless the day comes that you do, right? And that's one of the reasons why I'm scared, a bit scared of concurrency, or I used to be scared of concurrency, at least. Um, not because it can improve things, because I like that aspect about it. It scares me because it can sometimes make things a lot worse. And introducing concurrency can even make things slower. Let me give you an example of that. So. I, this year I worked in a, at the client site uh, in, a, in an Agile team, and one of uh, our team members had the role of Scrum Master. And he wanted to make the team learn about um, what happens when you try to divide work amongst multiple team members. So he wanted to teach us a lesson about focus, span, disturbing factors, and why you should try to limit the amount of work that is being worked on concurrently in your team. So he brought an exercise to the team. He said, let's do this exercise. He, call, he called it the illusion of multitasking, like you can see on the slide. And uh, in this exercise, there were two specific roles. There was one person, one team member, who played the role of the worker. They chose me. I mean, I was the software architect in this team, so probably they thought he's not doing any coding. Let's get him to work for a change, right? So I was the worker in this exercise, and my other team members, the developers, they played the role of managers. So we had one worker, we had five managers, and the worker got a Sharpie, a pen to write with, and the managers got a stack of sticky notes. And we played out three scenarios here. So the first scenario, I was sitting at a table with this Sharpie in my hand, and all the managers started shouting to me at the same time. And what they wanted me to do was to get one of their sticky notes and write a single letter on it. 
So I was sitting there, and these five people were barking all these orders in my direction, right? F, M, L, write this down on this sticky note, but all at the same time. So it was very hard for me to, to know where my attention should go. And um, the top row of sticky notes that you see right there, so this row here, this is the result of that first session, right? So they all thought of a name, uh, someone they knew, or a, a colleague or a coworker or something, and they wanted me to write the name, but they could only s spell out the, the letters by single letters, right? So I wrote down a V and an E. Um, that was scenario, uh, first scenario. And then we kept track of two uh, outcomes of this session. So the first one was the time it took until the first result was available. So in this case, one minute, nine seconds. And the second one was time it took until all results were available. So in this case, one minute, 37 seconds. Then we went on to scenario two, where all the managers formed a line. So there was one manager in front of me at all times. Um, and they just said, here's a sticky note, write an F. And the second one said, here's a sticky note, write a T. And here's a sticky note, write an E or something. Well, this line, of course, cycled a few times. And at the end, um, the second row of sticky notes was created, right? And it took 1 minute 23 until the first result and 1 minute 47 until the final result, until all results were available. And finally, of course, um, we formed a line again with these managers, but when it was their turn, they could spell out the entire name in front of me. I wrote the entire name and then they took their sticky notes with them and the second manager came on to me. And in this uh, scenario, it took nine seconds until the first result and 53 for all results to be finished. So we can learn a few things from this e exercise, of course. Um, first thing I learned, almost nothing gets done when there are five managers and one worker. Nothing at all, so don't do that, right? That's not a good manager-worker ratio. Second thing I learned, a lot of time can be lost when you switch context, when you're constantly context switching. And this especially became evident in scenario two, where all the managers formed the line and had to walk around and all that stuff. Um, and the third thing we learned was when the work can only be done by a single person, well, then you can only do a single task at the same time. And adding concurrency will then definitely make things slower because that single like, point of failure has to divide their time over multiple tasks. So in this example, we have seen that concurrency can have both positive and negative effects. And in this exercise, just negative effects, actually. Um, so let's get to um, the journey so far. I'm not sure what is happening to my notes here. I'm sorry, I have to restart my slides over again. Sorry about that. This has never happened before, but of course, everyone says that, right? <laughs> it's always the wrong moment, that's very true. I'm so happy that, that this, n this is not a 30-minute session, right? Very happy for that. Let me just restart my web server here. <laughs> I didn't intend it for to become a live demo, demo so early in the talk, right? But it turns out that this is the first demo and I didn't know about it. OK. 
Okay, I'm just going to uh, view the next slide and then it looks like everything is working again, so that's fine with me. Okay, so I had a slide on there that said the journey so far. Because, um, as you could also already read in the abstract, this talk is essentially meant to teach you about structured concurrency and scoped values, right? And I could deliver this in like 15 minutes if I wanted to, but then I don't think you would appreciate the reason why Java 22 and Java 23 had the addition of structured concurrency and scoped values. What is the actual use case? Or what problems or drawbacks are we trying to solve by adding these features to the Java language? And also, um, because concurrency is a topic that you don't really uh, meet in your daily life as a software developer in general, I think it's very good to see what journey we have been through until now and also what building blocks um, are used in the new features so you can appreciate how it works and uh, why it works that way. And when we're dealing with complicated uh, programming language features, I always feel it's a good idea to think of an, an example domain that, is really, uh, that really tells a lot, right? That, that everyone can relate to. Uh, so in this case, I thought about the, the restaurant domain. So in our code examples that we're going to use, we are going to go for a nice fancy dinner at a restaurant, right? And um, we are going to use this concept during our live demos. But there is one peculiar thing about this restaurant, and that is that it's not a very good restaurant per se. In fact, a lot of things go wrong in this restaurant, which makes it a perfect example to talk about concurrency. Actually, when I came up with this, uh, this example domain, I kind of thought about these two characters. Anyone familiar with them? Yeah? We might have a generation thing going on here, but I, I used to love watch, watching Sesame Street, watching the sketches with uh, the waiter, Grover, who desperately tried to do the right thing in this restaurant here. Uh, but the, the client, Mr. Johnson, always got something else than what he wanted. In this case, a Lego brick, but probably he ordered something else. Um, Hand-drawn by my wife, by the way. The hand of applause for my wife. I mean, yeah. I mean, the saying goes like this, opposites attract right, and I cannot draw for my life. And this is what she can do, so I'm so very happy that we're opposites. <laughs> and uh, that she can help me, uh, help contribute to my talk here and uh, avoid any copyright infringement along the process. All right. Um, so, we are dealing with the restaurants today. And the first thing I, I want to talk you through is to create a, a restaurant that has a single waiter. Single waiter only. To see how that would work. So I fired up my IDE here, and I have, this is a code repository that will be on the final slide, so if you want to play around with this code, you can. So it will be on the final slide for you to take a picture of or, or whatever. Um, but there's not a lot of code here, right? So uh, most of the, co the code we are going to create. And um, for our first example, we are looking at the restaurant interface. Is this, uh, is this readable for everyone also in the back? Yeah, it's okay. I see thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, so it's a very simple interface. Our restaurant has only one method. It's called announce menu. Let's announce the menu of this evening. Right? And it's a very simple concept. Um, the menu is a single multi-course meal, and a multi-course meal consists of several courses. Right in our example, we will use three separate courses each time. So this is actually the only thing a restaurant does. Right? Well, that means that we can create one of those restaurants. So let's create a main class here. Main restaurant. And actually, it doesn't even have to be a class. We can make it a, an implicitly declared class with a main method like this, starting from Java. 22, not moin, main, there we go. Means we have to lose the package declaration. But that is enough. So that's very nice. 
it will save us a few seconds, right? Um, let's create a restaurant then. And I'm going to call it a single waiter restaurant. We have to create that class, of course. And when the restaurant has crea been created, I want it to announce the menu. I think this one throws an exception. It does. You should always catch your exceptions, right? OK. Not today. OK, so uh, we are having a single waiter restaurant here. And because it implements restaurant, of course, it has to override this method, implement the announce menu method. Well, the waiter today that has the sad task of being a waiter to all tables is Elmo. Of course, the famous red creature from, from Sesame Street. And um, we're just creating him and uh, giving him a name. There we go. And uh, Elmo can announce a few courses. So he can, for example, announce the, the starters This in this case. He announces the starter, and he also announces the main course, and he announces the dessert, like that. And several courses are produced here. I'm sorry, I have to create this starter. This one is called main, and the final one is called dessert. Now, Elmo has announced all courses. That means we can return a new multi-course meal that has starter, main, and dessert in it. Right, so um, let's just run this example for now. So you can have a feel what happens. Probably this is an out-of-stock exception. I'll get to the out-of-stock exception later, but it's, it's an exception that I intended and that occurs sometimes, or well, often in this case. <laughs> okay, so this is what happens, right? So these output lines here, um, the waiter's talking to the, the customers, right? And then when there's a tab in there, the, he's talking to the chef because he's asking the chef for today's starter course. And the chef then decides on a specific starter course, course. And this can be random, right? So today it's creamy tomato soup. And when that result is, is available, Elmo can announce it to the customers. And the same thing happens with the main course and with the desserts. Just to get you a feel of how that works, when a waiter announces a course, it first wants to know if he or she has been properly, inter uh, properly introduced. And if they have not been introduced, they'll introduce them. Hello, my name is this. I'll wait your table today. So that's this output, right? And uh, after the introduction, the actual announcing can begin. So he'll talk to the chef to, to de determine today's course, and we'll ask the chef to pick the course. This will take some time, of course and then the announcement takes place. To give you an idea of how the course picking works, we've got a very static list of, of courses here, things people can eat, right? a few choices for every category. So a few choices for starters, a few for main, a few for dessert, and the chef just picks one of them, a random one. But there's a catch. You already saw it in the output, the exceptions. right? So every ingredient, has a certain probability that it is out of stock. And it's defined in the ingredient class, right? There's a certain probability. Every ingredient has a 5% probability of being out of stock. And this is an important concept for uh, the rest of the talk, because we ha we're talking about how to deal with concurrency when tasks can fail. right? So those were the exceptions that you saw. Sometimes can be out of stock, and you have to deal with that. Okay, let's return to our restaurant. Okay, so we saw that there was a restaurant interface with a single method. We saw that uh, well, we actually live coded this code. 
right, with a single waiter. And it's kind of, almost kind of a poor waiter here because he has to do all the work and it's not divided in any way. And also it's all sequential, right? But I really want three waiters to be at the table asking this customer to order or, or asking to them to um, not make a choice because actually we are telling them what they can eat, um, asking them for their attention, right, to, um, to listen to the waiter. So that's, that's the situation I want to end up in. It may be a bit overwhelming to the customer to have three waiters at your table, but on the other hand, very fast service, right? So that's also a good thing. So let's uh, get into the threads because everything we have done until now wasn't concurrent at all. And of course we want multiple waiters. That means that we're creating a new restaurant here and it can again uh, be an implementation of re the restaurant interface. So let's call that a multi waiter. And I'm going to create a lo lot of multi waiter restaurants. So in this case, multi waiter threads. Okay. When threads were introduced to Java, I think it was in the very beginning of the language, Java 1.0. Um, the only way to create a thread was to extend it, right? Extend thread, then you could have a user thread. So uh, the runnable interface, the callable interface, they all came la later in the language. That also meant that if you were creating your own threads, you would also have to keep track of any intermediate results, right? So your child thread that extends the Java thread should have a field or something to make sure that the result that the thread is going to uh, talk about uh, would be stored. So that means that if we want to use threads here, we have to create a sub uh, subclass here. We can do it like this: waiter announce. Let's call it the waiter announce course thread extends thread. Let's give this one a private final waiter and uh, course type, of course, yes. And here we store the result that the thread is going to uh, yield, which is the announced course. Announced course, there we go. Let's create a constructor to properly initialize um, the thread here. There we go. Initialize the, the final fields, of course. And if we extend thread, then we have to override the run method. There it is. So what will the thread do? Well, it will try to fill the announced course field with the result of waiter dot announce course course type. This, those exceptions, let's, let's catch them this time. And print something. And we also need a getter for this field. There we go. Now we can work on the code that announces the menu. Let's create a few waiters. I'm going to do this a lot of times, so I've created a code template for it. For it. And this time we're bringing in three new waiters because Elmo is, is overworked right now because he had to do all the work by himself. So Grover, Zoe and Rosita are coming in, three famous Sesame Street characters, to wait the tables of this customer. And we're going to create one thread that does announces the starter course. Um, new waiter announce course, there we go. Of course, a main thread. That's kind of a strange name, right? Main thread, but it announces the main course, so. And want to announce the dessert. Let's start all these threads and wait for them to finish by calling join. 
This is how we used to do things back in Java 1.0. Trip down memory lane, right? Um, and once all the joins have finished here, those are blocking methods, by the way, blocking calls. So once the final one is finished, we can be sure that there, is, there are results and we can return a new multi-course meal. But then we have to ask the threads for the announced courses like this. And also the dessert thread. And I think that's about it for the, the thread example here. This one can probably be static. There we go. Let's run the main restaurant, see what happens. Okay, so what we see now is that we've got three separate announcements. Grover, Zoe, and Rosita are all introducing them themselves, actually, and they're all talking to the chef for the main course. Uh, starter, dessert, it's concurrency, so we cannot predict the order of these output statements. And the chef is picking three courses here, three dishes, and um, they are announced by three waiters here. So that's how we would do things with just threads. Right, this is how it turned out, which is the code that we just wrote with uh, the separate class of the waiter announced course thread. So the Java thread, the basic building block of any concurrency uh, construct, has a few pros and cons, right? I mean, I like the fact that we're doing multiple things at once, but that's kind of the point of using multiple threads. Uh, but one of the cons is we cannot return a value directly. I had to define a field and populate it and ask for it in a getter. Um, and this is actually the biggest drawback, in my opinion. We have defined a workload, which is half the waiter announced the course. And we have defined the mechanism to run it on the thread. But they are all defined, both defined in the same construct. Or to put it differently, th these two different concerns are very tightly coupled right now. The way to run it, the thread, and the actual work to be done. It's also defined in the thread via the overridden run method. And um, this is a drawback that has been, um, has been improved upon uh, with the introduction of the executor service interface. Someone who has used this in the past, executor service? Ah, oh, quite a few people, that's good to see. That's good to see, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so we can use that in Java 1.5 and, and it can execute tasks that are submitted to it. And it also supports task queuing, so you can submit a lot of work to it and it can decide for itself um, when it's going to perform that work. Uh, put it in a queue and, um, and, and see when, uh, whenever there, there will be time and space to execute the stuff that you sent to it, that you submit to it. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that looks cool. Let's, uh, let's try that out and create another multi-waiter restaurant, but then run by an executive service. So we're going to return to our uh, main restaurant again. Exec. Computer service. This is, of course, again, and the implementation of the restaurant interface. So let's implement announce menu again. Define a few waiters. And as you may know, executor service um, also extends the auto closable interface, which means that you can use it in a try with resources statement, and it will automatically close down when. Uh, the try with resources block ends. So that's what we want to do today. Let's start off with a new fixed thread pool using three threads. And we can submit a few tasks. Submit Grover.announce course uh, starter. Right, Zoe is not announcing the starter, she's announcing the mains. There we go. Dessert. Now, um, the return type of the submit method is actually future. 
So that means that we um, we have to call get on these future objects. Desert future. Ah, it has to be part of the try block. There we go. Anyone know what uh, the major issue is with the future.get? Yeah, it blocks. It blocks, so imagine this takes a very long time. Not sure why, but announcing starter courses is going to take very long today. That means that when we get to here, we will wait for the result of get to be available. If this one takes the longest time and these are finished quite soon, we will still block for this one. Wait for it to finish, then we can get to the next one. So that's one of the major drawbacks. I think I've got them listed on the slides as well, by the way. Right, so this is how that looks with executor service. Um, and um, I want to I want to draw your attention to like the the things that we approved upon and the things that are still require some improvement in the future. So compared to our thread solution, this is a lot better, right? For example, um, we have now separated um, the workload and the mechanism to run it on, right? So in the previous example, if I wanted to run the same amount of work on two threads, I would have to make considerable changes to the code. In this case, I can just decrease the three integer literal here to two, and it would run on two threads. Right? If I wanted to use the new virtual threads, I could just right, um, call a different method from the executor's class, and uh, we would have virtual threads. So that's very extensible. But there are still a few things here that bother me. And it starts with this one. So let's assume that announcing the main course today takes a long time. Um, well, that could be. If it really takes a long time, let's just make sure that it, it runs until the end. Uh, what if this call fails in the meantime? What if we're totally out of salmon and the, the picked course for the starter had a lot of do with, to do with salmon? Then this one would throw an exception. And that also means that um, the entire return value of this method would wait for the result of main.get to become available. Um, whereas we already know that we, we will never be able to construct a valid multi-course meal because we can't serve the starter course today. So the sensible thing to do here is when you know that you cannot construct a valid multi-course meal just to cancel the entire operation. But that's not what happens with executor service. We block on main.get until that operation is done. And only after that, we see that there was an exception thrown by the starter one. Second thing I don't like about this code example here, if an exception happens in this line, so announcing the main course, well, it will be thrown eventually by line 13, main.get. Main.get is the one that throws the exception that happens, that happens on line uh, 10. But if this one takes longer to run, the thread will continue to run, announcing starter courses, even after we have thrown the exception that was thrown by the main task. Right, so these threads that, ha that ha are starting here in the executive servers are still running, even after the exception has been thrown. And one final remark here, if the entire thread is interrupted, that is, executing this method, so it could be the main thread, for example, 
uh, this interruption will not propagate to the subtasks. So all threads that are started here between line 9 and line 11, they will leak and they will continue to run even after the, announce, the entire announce method has failed. Ultimately, the problem that we have here is that our program is logically structured with task-subtask relationships because we need three completely assembled courses to get to a multi-course meal. But these relationships don't exist in the code. They might exist in the real world. They may exist in the mind of a developer who wrote this. Uh, but there's no way that we can express these kind of relationships using Java's executor service. And that is because the executor service in Java is based on the idea of unstructured concurrency, which means that you can freely spawn any threads you want, um, make the new threads spawn new threads, and build all kinds of intricate um, thread starting mechanisms without having any guarantee that they will succeed or they will continue or they will terminate their work in time or in a specific place in the code. We've seen a few good things though. We've seen that tasks can now re directly return a value. You don't have to set a field in a thread class, subclass anymore. We see that the workload and the run mechanism are separated, but it will also wait for all tasks to terminate, even if we're already sure that we will never get to the desired end result. And it allows unrestricted pattern, patterns of concurrency. Right? It's very hard, like I said, with executor service to create relationships among tasks and subtasks. Right? You, in theory, you could have one thread create an executor service and the second thread submit work to it. And the threads that actually ex execute the work on behalf of the executor service would have no relationship whatsoever to the first thread that we started or the second thread we started. And to get a mental model in your minds of this, it can perhaps help to think of um, a notorious statement from one of the oldest languages around, which is basic, the basic language. Um, and if you remember correctly, the basic language had the go-to statement, the go-to command that said go to 030, go to 090. Um, and these go-to statements are also called one-way jumps. And it's a one-way jump because you're calling it from, I don't know, line 020, and you're sending it to line 090, but you don't have any guarantee that it will return to line 020. It just continues somewhere else. One-way jumps. And this is the idea behind unstructured concurrency also. You're jumping somewhere, performing work somewhere, but you have no idea where it, where it returns uh, or when all these threads are done because they could still be running in the background. So we have to conclude that executor service allows unrestricted patterns of concurrency. And this is something that we, uh, we will return to when we, go, we start talking about structured concurrency. Okay, then we have to talk about completable futures for a bit, because this is a construct in Java's concurrency journey that was specifically created to deal with the problems that the future came with. Uh, so you can use them since Java 8, and it is an API that is meant to compose asynchronous operations. It handles eventual results in a declarative way, and it, like I said, it aims to fix the problems that we had with the future because the future cannot be manually completed and you cannot perform any further actions on a, f on a future without blocking or waiting for the result first. Uh, there's also no way to chain multiple futures together. Um, and it doesn't support exception handling just with the future interface. I have put an example, some example code on the slides um, to give you an idea of how, the, how our restaurant problem could be solved with completable future. So recall that this was the code that we, what, that we saw recently in our IDE. If we would solve this with completable futures, it would probably look like this. Um, 
We would still have um, the announcements here, but we have to model them as completable future. So there's a method here that converts a callable to a completable future. It's a lot of code. <laughs> um, in the end, you return the future here. And um, it is executed on the default executor. So that's probably the fork join pool, I think. And um, if you want to wait for all of them to finish, you would wrap them in a completable future dot all of and it would wait for all of these three futures to finish. Uh, well, that would actually be the, the result of this join operation here. And if you get to this line, line 14, you would be sure that the work has been done. It looks a bit better, but also it looks a bit worse. I mean, yes, it's true that we can wait for everything to be done here. Uh, so that helps. Um, but we also have to convert them to completable futures. And also, the thing that the completable future API is very good at is building these asynchronous pipelines. So I have an asynchronous job here, and when that one finishes, you should immediately start the next one, and you should immediately start the next one. And this is not that kind of problem. We are just announcing courses, and when the announcement is done, we're, we're done. And we just have to wait for the other two announcements. So we are not really using... Um, the strong, the strongest point of the completable future here. Um, it is good to note, though, that uh, building asynchronous operations in a pipeline way and um, um, programming that logic declaratively is uh, also a property of reactive frameworks like Akka or Reactive Java. Those are constructions that that work based on the same ideas. And it's good to notice this because we will get back to this when we talk about virtual threats later on in the talk. The main benefit of completable future, in my opinion, is the ability to, like, like I said, chain these asynchronous operations. And that allows you to uh, omit any logic that um, waits for blocking results. Right, so uh, because completable futures work with the fork join pool, it can wake up a thread in the fork join pool any time uh, a new asynchronous um, stage is available. And um, one of those threads will then be used to execute the next stage in the asynchronous pipeline that you have defined. Okay. Well, we have talked about a few ways to model our announcing courses problem, and now we get to a concurrency construct that um, deals with something else entirely, but that we will also um, integrate in our restaurant domain. And it's, it's the thread local, which we can use since Java 1.2, and which has the very unique property that it models a variable that is unique to its own thread. So each thread has its own independently initialized copy of the variable. So imagine you need a certain value in many places in your code. Um, when you're not dealing with concurrent code, you would probably just use a global variable, maybe a final static variable, and refer to it everywhere. Um, if you're in a concurrent world, and you're dealing with multiple threads, and you want this value to change based on which thread runs it, then thread local would be a good choice. Because it's, it's kind of uh, ironic, because in the concurrency world, you almost always want all threads to have the same view of the variable. Because if one thread has a different view, like a few seconds earlier or later, you will run into race conditions. So in that way, it's ironic that there is a construct that specifically says, I don't want all threads to see the same value. I want all threads to see a different value. But there can be use cases where this is a very elegant solution. Um, they are most likely used in application frameworks where each request that comes from, for, for example, a web browser user um, wants to be identified with a certain request ID or a customer ID, then a thread local can be a good choice because the thread that that 
um, processes this request can have a unique ID assigned to it, and it will remain, it will keep that value in memory until the thread terminates. And a new thread that handles a new request will then, by design, have a different value. So the request ID will then also have a different value. And uh, one construct that I came up with is also ideas, announcement ideas. Um, until now, um, you may have noticed until now all the announcements had the same idea, and that is because until now it's just a constant in my code. But I think it's a good idea to make that dynamic with a thread local. So let's see how that works right now. That means that we are going to create a package called announcement and we'll have a class called announcement ID. Let's start by defining the private static final thread local. It's a wrapper type, so we wrap it around, for example, an integer, and we call it announcement ID. And we can call the, let's remove this, the thread local, local dot with initial factory method. And it creates a new thread local with an initial value. And we can pass a supplier here that results in the, the initial value. I want to use an atomic integer here. Static final atomic integer. Let's call it next ID. And we'll give that an initial value of one. And the supplier that I'm going to pass here is a reference to the get an increment method of the atomic integer, meaning that the first thread that um, refers to this announcement ID will get one as value, but uh, in the background it will be incremented. Yeah, it, it will be returned and then it will be incremented. And the second thread that comes here will get the, um, the value that has been increased by one. And the third thread that comes here will get the value that has been increased by one. So this results in the behavior that each thread gets a value that is just one higher than the previous one. Let's create a get method to retrieve the value um, of the thread local here. Like that. And if we want our announcements to use this, we would have to go to the waiter class and replace the literal that was that was hard coded announcement number here it is this is our announcement number it was one until now and it will be announcement id dot get and the same thing for our chef also as an announcement id of one announcement id dot get and if we now call our main restaurant code we will have different announcement IDs because they are executed with different threads. And you can also see that this was the first task that was finished. So that's why it got announcement ID one. Right, so this, these are the basics of thread locals. I never used them in any project before until I started teaching courses uh, at my workplace, info support about concurrency, right? So I imagine, Lots of you haven't used thread locals either directly, so that's it's good to see how they work. In order to appreciate the pros and cons. Right, so this was our announcement ID class and how to use them in your code. And um, this is the place where we called the announcement ID values. So pros and cons again. 
if you're dealing with this unique scenario that you need um, a variable that is different to each thread, it avoids cluttering method signatures because you can just refer to the same instance all over again. And I think it's a very elegant way to bind data that is unique to the current thread. But also can't, of course. Um, the thread local is always mutable. So you saw me in the example called the get method. Well, they also have a set method. And if you are sharing this thread local throughout your code, every place that has a reference to this variable will also be able to call the set method, which means that it is always mutable. So that's kind of a security risk. And also, thread local vari variables have an unbounded lifetime. That is, they will be in memory until the thread terminates. But is that a big issue, you may, may ask? Well, if your thread is performing work that is done very quickly, terminate fast, then the risks are kind of small, right? But that's just the issue with classic threads. Uh, most of us know that creating a thread in Java and disposing of it is kind of an expensive operation. I mean, it takes milliseconds, but that's ages, right? In computer terms. Um, so that's the reason why a lot of Java frameworks keep thread pools in memory. And that also means that you're not really sure how long one of those threads will be in memory. So consequently, you also don't really know for sure how long a thread local variable will be in memory, because it could be in one of those, threads, those threads in thread pools. You could programmatically remove them from memory. There's also a remove method, but of course you would have to remember to call that. I mean, there's a reason why there's an auto-closable interface now, because we tend to forget to call close. Well, this is exactly the same thing, but with thread locals. And um, a final con is memory intensive. It's not always the case, but they can be memory intensive. As you may know, you can, from a specific thread, you can also always start another thread, which we call child threads, child threads, parent threads, and a thread local can be made inheritable in the sense that if you create an inheritable thread local vari variable, the variable will also be available to the child thread. That wouldn't be such a big issue, uh, but it is. Uh, it can be because in order to access thread locals from a parent thread, a child thread copies the values to its own stack. And if you're doing that a lot of times in your code, you will have all kinds of duplicate thread local values. And if you're creating another child thread from the child thread that I just mentioned, both thread locals will be copied into the third one. So potentially, this can be memory intensive, especially when you're dealing with many threads. So this is a drawback that we, we must be aware of. Oh, well, while I was preparing this talk, it quickly turned into like a trip down memory lane of Java concurrency, so I felt it would be appropriate to mention a few concurrency constructs that I will not be using in the demo, but that do deserve an honorable mention, so that you're fully prepared for what is coming with a thorough understanding of the entire history of Java concurrency. So, I think uh, the re-entrant lock is an honorable mention, because as you may know, when you're dealing with rage conditions, uh, you want to synchronize the read and write access of your shared variables through the synchronized keyword. And that is useful, but it's not as flexible uh, or as versatile as a re-entrant block. A synchronized keyword, a synchronized block works by defining a scope in which only one thread is allowed in, which, uh, in which essentially um, makes sure that the variable is only accessed by a single thread at the same time. And with the re-entrant lock, you can achieve the same thing by calling the lock and unlock methods, but it can also be, uh, it can also contain multiple methods, right? You can, you can uh, lock the re-entrant lock, call a method, call another method, call another one, and then unlock again. And this is not possible with synchronized blocks, or it, it, is, it is more difficult because you are bound to this block scoping.
Of course, you should always make sure that these lock regions are as small as possible because they can hurt your concurrency and your throughput. Um, but it is a more flexible alternative, and there are also features like uh, giving certain threads more chance to acquire the lock than other ones. Uh, it's called the fairness setting, so that's, that's kind of cool stuff. If you're into that, you should definitely check it out. Um, the fork join pool I already mentioned, I think, with completable futures, which is a specialized implementation of executor, which uh, is very good with compute intensive tasks. In the course that I teach, that I mentioned earlier, I use a fork join pool to index my, my hard drive and count how many Java files are in my hard drive. And then I compare them to you know, JavaScript files and C sharp files. And then people make fun of me because I have more JS files on my computer than Java files. And I tell them it's because of Node.js, but they, they don't believe me. Um, at least um, what it proves, I think, is that uh, for problems that have um, a rec some recursive properties to it, like scanning a hard disk with multiple folders and subfolders. A fork join pool is a good choice. And it's also, um, like I said, the default thread pool that is used for parallel streams and for completable futures. Uh, we've used an atomic integer uh, just now. Um, there are all kinds of atomic implementations for Booleans and other data types. Um, but you can also define a generic atomic reference that manages an object reference of your choice, ensuring atomic threat safe operations. So if your concurrency problem is limit, limited to just one single field, this could be a good choice. And you wouldn't necessarily need locks here. Then we have the semaphore, which is a concurrency construct that restricts thread access to a shared resource. Uh, and you initialize it with a specific limited number of permits. Right, so when it was uh, COVID lockdown time, my local supermarket had a big screen at the entrance that said only 50 customers allowed. Well, you could implement that with a semaphore. I'm not sure if it was done with the, one of those, but you could a semaphore set to 50. And when it reaches zero, no one is allowed in until someone exits the store. And uh, finally, countdown latch which is kind of a semaphore the other way around. Um, this enables threads to wait for a set of operations to complete before proceeding. Uh, you could, for example, create a countdown ledge that says only proceed when the countdown ledge has reached 20 and then have each thread increment this counter. When it becomes 20, it stops the blocking and your code continues. Countdown latches can be very good uh, solutions for example, integration testing. Integration tests that also use multiple threads because it can be a way to coordinate when it is time to run your assertions at the end of the integration test. Have all these multiple threads increment the countdown latch and if it reaches the desired value, you can start running your assertions. So in a way we have now covered all history of Java concurrency until virtual threads. And you might be wondering by now, why does this stuff interest you? <laughs> I mean, it's so, it's so detailed and deep divey. Well, we're, we are in a deep dive after all, so that kind of figures. Um, but like I said, um, when I'm not at client project consulting, um, I'm at my employer InfoSupport in the Netherlands to teach courses. And one of the courses I teach is called Concurrency in Java. So it's a topic that I've uh, spent some time with. And uh, the w yeah, a topic that I love. So that's one of the reasons why this talk came about. Uh, but also I like to write about new features in Java that become available. And a lot of new features have come out in the past years. So uh, I wrote a few articles for the Fuji.io website uh, which are essentially overviews of the additions in the Java language per, uh, per release. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check it out. Um, and I have introduced myself, but a bit quickly, so let's finish it for a bit. Um, Hanno Embrechts, I work at InfoSupport. 
as a consultant, but also as a trainer. And I also like to go to conferences and share about stuff, stuff that I spend way too many time, m too much time on. So that's kind of um, that's kind of um, the theme in my talks. So some talks can be about Java features, others about version control. Um, and this one is about concurrency because I spend way too much time on it. Uh, so why not make use of that knowledge, right? Um, I'm both a Java champion and an Oracle ace, and I like to keep people updated about what I do at Macedon Blue Sky or Twitter. Let's just keep calling it Twitter, right? Only to annoy Elon Musk. It's always good when he's annoyed. Um, I remember coming up with the handle, Hanotify. I thought it was rather clever, right? Get notified of everything that Hanno does. But my wife just laughed at me. I said, you're such a major geek. And I took that as a compliment. Um, but if you're into the stuff that I just talked about, new features in Java, concurrency, version control, uh, I like to make some music in my spare time. I sometimes post about that too. If you're interested in that, feel free to give me a follow wherever you like to keep your contacts. Okay, we can make a head start as virtual threats just before the break. Everything I told you until now was our journey until now. We're getting to the new stuff now. Uh, virtual threads were made final in Java 21. So that means if you are on Java 21 with your project, you can start using them without worrying about changing APIs because they won't change, or at least they will be backwards compatible from now into the future. I already mentioned that the classic thread in Java is expensive to start up, to create, and expensive to tear down. And so the virtual thread tries to be different in that respect and wants to be a lightweight thread implementation. And it achieves that by not having an explicit mapping to an operating system thread. This is completely opposite of classic threads because a thread in Java will also be a thread in the operating system. And it's intended to run only a single task over its lifetime. That doesn't mean that it cannot do multiple tasks, but because it, they can be created quickly, they can be disposed of quickly, it doesn't really make sense to keep them in memory longer, longer than for the single task that it's supposed to execute. And with the virtual thread, um, we needed a new term for the operating system thread that it actually runs on. So we came up with carrier thread, and this is the term that I'll try to use from now on in the talk. I hope I'll stick to it. Um, and this distinction was not very important with classic threads because a thread was also a carrier thread, and it had a one-on-one -on -one map mapping, whether you were talking about the thread in the OS or the thread in the JVM. But with virtual threads, the one-on-one -on -one mapping is no more, and I've brought I created a graphic, or at least used a graphic and modified it a bit to explain a bit more what I mean here. Right, so um, when I talk about carrier threads, I talk about these ones, right? Platform threads. These are all just instances of the Java thread class, and they will still have a one on one mapping with the operating system threads, but we no longer directly talk to these platform threads. We can now talk to the virtual threads, which are the red dots here, right? And we can create them and submit work to them, and they will run on a platform thread eventually somewhere. And that platform thread will have the one-on-one -on -one mapping with the OS thread, but that's no concern to us anymore. We don't have to think about it anymore. And I hope this image also makes clear that we can have a lot more virtual threads than we used to have platform threads in the past. This also means that when we submit work to it, the work will eventually be done by one of those carrier threads there. And um, I have deliberately uh, decided to have 
two arrows pointing to a single blue circle here, because it's very likely that multiple virtual threads will use the same platform thread to run their work. It's not up to us, it's scheduled by the JVM, and it will probably keep that platform thread, that carrier thread, alive for longer than just the duration of the talk that we, uh, the, the task that we submit to the virtual thread. But it's not, it's not our circle of influence, and it also doesn't have to be. We can deal with virtual threads, and the JVM will decide where to run it. I felt like um, an analogy would be in order here, so I like to compare the classic threads we used to big trains. There are like 10 or 11 uh, of them on these tracks in the same picture. They are slow to start, they are slow to stop, but when they are running, they can perform an awesome amount of work, right? Um, and I'll have to give credit where credit is due, because I wasn't the first one to come up with this analogy. Other people before me, way smarter than me, came up with it, so it's a good analogy then. Uh, and if you think of classic thread as freight trains or passenger trains, then virtual threads are definitely taxis, right? That are, that are quick to start and quick to stop, and that can take off in a few seconds and uh, disappear in a sea of other taxis. This is not a real picture, by the way, because some of the taxis are turned around and ha half a taxi is missing, generated by Leonardo AI. <laughs> but I think you get the picture. If you put this in a sequence diagram, I think it becomes clear what the added benefit of virtual threads actually is. So I have ke come up with a scenario here. So let's say we have to fetch some database data, right? Right here. We, in a classic thread example, we would pull the thread from the thread pool, do some processing, fetch the database data. Well, we have to wait for the data, so this thread blocks until the database data arrives do some processing, fetch some data from a server, we block again, we get our data back, we send data to another service, we block again, 200 OK, we do some processing and we're done, and we're releasing the thread from the thread pool. We are keeping this platform thread busy for the entirety of this piece of code, this processing uh, steps here. This platform thread cannot do anything else. If we would do the same thing with virtual threads, this is how I would change the picture. The virtual thread would essentially do the same and uh, show the same behavior, right? It does processing, it blocks, it does processing, it blocks. So we are keeping this virtual thread busy for the entirety of the processing. But the virtual thread doesn't exist, right, on the OS. It's not the mechanism that runs everything. It's just a concept in the JVM. Um, the actual thread that is running the work might be this one. Does this bit of processing. And this could be performed by a second carrier thread. I'm not sure. I don't have control over the scheduling. This piece of processing might be passed to this thread again. And I think what this picture shows is that we are no longer blocking uh, the platform threads, the courier threads. So compared to, sorry, compared to this image, where we keep one platform thread busy for the entirety of this processing, now we're keeping two threads not really that busy, right? They have a few uh, pieces of processing here, but if you would merge them together, we would still have time left to do other stuff. That is because we have gotten rid of these blocking phases. The actual carrier threads are no longer blocking because the blocking logic is all encapsulated in the virtual thread. Well, this doesn't mean that virtual threads perform their work faster, but it does mean that we can do more work with the same amount of resources. Or to put it differently, it's not going to go faster, but we can offer a significantly higher throughput. We can do more work at the same time by just making more efficient use of the available platform threads. I have done a few tests. 
client projects and I have seen systems that were able to reach 35 to 40 percent more throughput just by switching to virtual threads. So that's, that's kind of significant. So that's very cool. And it's also very easy to start using them. I mean, you can create virtual threads directly. A virtual thread is also um, compatible with the thread class. So you can just assign a virtual thread to a thread, use the same methods. But with executor servers, it's even simpler because we can just change that fixed thread pool line to a new virtual thread per task executor. And we would be running this code using virtual threads instead of classic threads. So the pros of virtual thread is that millions of threads can run. Uh, I've tested this on my MacBook Pro M1. I could create 8,000 th classic threads and almost 950,000 virtual threads. Same configuration. So that's a kind of a big difference. And the reason is that a classic thread, a platform thread, um, always has to have its own stack. And by default, Java assigns one megabyte of memory for the stack. So that probably meant that I had eight gigabytes of memory assigned to my Java process when I did this test. Um, but virtual threads um, have a specific um, stack construct. It's called stack chunk objects, and they are not stored in a separate stack. They are stored in the heap, which also means that they are eligible for garbage collection, just like regular objects in Java. So that's the reason why you can have many more of them. Um, and it also means that you could allow the thread per request style. You don't have to pull your threads anymore. You don't have to share your threads anymore. If you don't want to, you can just create new virtual threads for each task that you perform. Like I said, to create them is cheap, to dispose of them is cheap. And we saw on the graphic already that the throughput will be better with a higher number of concurrent I.O. heavy tasks. That is a good point, though. It will perform best when you have I.O. heavy stuff. Because in the graphic, we already showed you that um, the amount of throughput that we can gain is related to the amount of blocking that you had. And blocking, of course, only happens when you do I.O. stuff. So if you've got a CPU heavy task, I don't think virtual threads will perform that better than classic threads. So that's to keep in mind. There are a few cons. There are minor risks, but uh, I do want to point them out anyway. Uh, thread pinning. So a pinned thread is a thread that is currently assigned to a carrier thread, uh, but cannot be removed from them for a certain amount of time. It cannot be unmounted. And there are two scenarios in which this happens. Uh, when a virtual thread is executing a native method or a foreign function outside of the scope of the JVM, it cannot be unmounted. And when it executes code inside a synchronized block, it cannot be unmounted for the duration of the synchronized block. If you are thinking about switching to virtual threads and you know that you have a lot of synchronized blocks, you could mitigate this drawback by starting to use re-entrant locks or maybe countdown latches, because if you use them, that will not come with the thread pinning. This has something to do with uh, the lock support class. That's a support class in the JDK that is used by re entrant lock and countdown latches. And that class supports parking and unparking of virtual threads, which makes sure that the pinning doesn't happen. So that's something that you could do about this drawback. And the second one is thread local variables. The construct that we talked about earlier, they don't perform very well with many threads. And this has to do with these inheritable thread locals that get copied to the child threads. Now, if you've got 30 threads, it might not be a big risk. But if you've got millions of threads, like is possible with virtual threads, this becomes a significantly higher risk. In fact, in the JDK, this construct is used also, and they have added uh, system property called trace virtual thread locals for this very purpose. So if you're if you think that the risk is high for your project, you could set this system property to true, 
and every time a virtual thread uses the value or sets the value of a thread local variable, it will trigger a stack trace. And that way you can keep track of any places in your code that use this construct. So that's something that you could use to your benefit. Moving on to the next section and nearing, uh, nearing the, our scheduled break also. We've mentioned all kinds of pros and cons. And the question that's interesting to me is what drawbacks used to be minor drawbacks, but could be bigger drawbacks now that virtual threads are available. I think it's, it, it is these two. The first one is executor service allowing unrestricted patterns of concurrency. This was kind of a problem with a limited number of threads, but if you're going to use potentially millions of threads, um, it becomes very unstructured indeed. And it's very hard to keep track of, of threads that have spawned off in some direction. Um, and it's very hard to get to a point where all threads are done. So a structured approach could be beneficial here. And secondly, the memory intensity of thread locals is a, is a risk, like I already said. Um, so uh, a construct that, has a, that uses less memory for the same thing would also be beneficial. Uh, well, the question is, is this the final station? Is a rhetorical one, uh, because the developments in the Java language uh, in the field of concurrency are specifically targeted towards these two questions. How can we make sure that threads can be coordinated in a structured way? And how can we solve the issue of memory intensity when we are having access to millions of threads? Okay, I think this is a good point in the talk to take a break. Almost 30 minutes, let's uh, meet back here at 3.15 and then I will walk you through structured concurrency and scoped values and how it will solve our problems, hopefully. See you back in 30 minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. Good to see so many of you still here. I was just uh, queuing up in line for the toilets and I thought, why did I spend so much time thinking of an example domain when it's just right in front of me, right? That's a concurrency problem right there. Lots of queuing. So let's see if something like structured concurrency could solve this, right? Um, recall we had a few problems. We, were, we had two drawbacks that we wanted to address, right? The unstructured concurrency that executor services comes with and secondly, the memory intensity of thread locals. So let's jump into the structured concurrency and see how far we can get. So like I said, it's a fairly new feature. It's been incubating into Java versions and it's in third preview in Java 23. That means that you can try it out. You can give feedback to the Java language designers, but that specific details of the API can still change. So if you want to use it, uh, be prepared for a migration strategy or, you know, if it gets dropped entirely, I'm not really, um, it's not that it's, that I expect it to be dropped, but you always have to be careful with preview features. So at least pass the compiler option dash dash enable preview to be able to use it. The problem that we were trying to solve, I have summarized it on this slide here, um, which is the executor service version of our problem domain but in this case with virtual threads, like you can see here. And what I want to achieve is if one of these subtasks here throws an exception, that we can communicate this exception to the other two subtasks so that they don't keep running and doing unnecessary work for us. And um, interestingly, if you would look at the single threaded version of this code, a lot of the cons that we saw in executor service would actually be fixed right away. Because what if uh, announce course starter fails, then it throws an exception directly and the other two tasks won't even be started. So what I'm looking for is a concurrent version of this code where the structure is just as clear and where the uh, failures are communicated in a clear way. And I think structured concurrency can play a role here. So it is an approach to concurrent programming that preserves the natural relationship between tasks and subtasks, which leads to more readable, maintainable, 
and reliable concurrent code. It's not a new concept in Java, why well, it's new to Java, um, but it has been implemented before. Uh, the term was coined by Martin Sustrick in 2016 when he worked on the Go language and more specifically Go routines in the Go language. Um, it is also a feature in Kotlin. Uh, you might know it as coroutines. Uh, they can also function in a structured way. Uh, so a prominent feature in both Go and Kotlin and now also in Java. I mentioned the term one-way jump earlier when I talked about the notorious go-to statement in the basic language. Well, spawning a thread in Java is essentially a one-way jump. You pass some work, a task, to a specific thread and you're not sure when it will terminate or when it will return the result. Uh, structured concurrency is a way to turn this into a two-way jump because threads in a structured context run in their own scope. That's the gray area you see here to the right, the scope. And with structured concurrency, it is always enforced that the threads that have been spawned will return to the same place. And they have, so to speak, clear entry points and clear exit points, and only one of each. Entry point for the scope, entry point for the task, exit point here. Whereas with unstructured, there's an entry point, but you're not sure when it will return. And this is a simple hierarchy, but it is possible to entirely possible to build more complicated hierarchies in here. Spawning three different tasks that then all return to a single one, like here with the orange, uh, the orange part of the graphic. So you could create a tree of threads like they have like parent-child relationships. And this is all because this concept of scoping. A scope in structured concurrency continues until all child threads have completed. And this results in a strict nesting of the lifetimes of operations in a way that mirrors their syntactic nesting in the code. So the nesting in the code will mirror the way the lifetimes of operations behave. We will see this in the code example in a few minutes. But it also comes with a streamlined error and cancellation propagation. And this ultimately leads, in, leads to improved reliability and observability in concurrent code. If we summarize these concepts, we can conclude that if a task splits into concurrent subtasks, then they all return to the same place, namely the task's code block. And the best way to demo this, of course, is to see it in action. So let's create a structured concurrency restaurant, right? Because we didn't have enough restaurants already. Uh, but this is one of the more exciting ones, at least in my opinion. We return to our main restaurant here and we create a structured concurrency restaurant, which doesn't exist yet, of course. So let's make sure it exists implementing the restaurant interface like before, announcing the menu, and we are again calling in the help of our three waiters. Okay, so structured concurrency works with scopes, and this scope can be opened and closed, so it works with the familiar try with resources construct that we used earlier. We create a variable scope, and it is an instance of structured task scope dot shut down on failure. New. I've done Kotlin all week, can you tell? <laughs> New. Um, yes, and now we are uh, we can announce some courses. I have done this before, so I'll use my code template here. I have told three waiters to announce courses. This is the exact same thing as before. But in this case, we pass uh, this lambda to the fork method of scope, right? So scope has a method fork. We can pass a callable there and we get a result. Um, now we have to tell the scope to wait for all tasks to finish. We can do that by calling join. But we can also pass it an instruction what to do with any failures. And that is what we can achieve by calling throw if failed. 
And the benefit of this is that when we reach line 23, we can be sure that everything has succeeded. Because if a failure has occurred, this method will throw an execution exception and we'll, we'll, we, will, we will never reach line 23. That has a benefit because here we can just simply return a new multi-course meal. And let's use our results here. This is a funny thing. You might, you might assume that because I'm calling get, that these three variables are futures again, but actually they are, can you see? They are structured task scope dot subtask, extends supplier. So they are an extension of the supplier functional interface. They come with structured concurrency. That also means that these are not blocking methods. They are just simply calls to a supplier. And they don't have to be blocking either because we have called join already here. Um, and join is the, is the call that blocks. So after join has finished, we will be sure that the work is done. That is a good question. What happens if you call get before join? Well, let's run the example and then try it out, shall we? Is that okay with you? Okay. Okay, so we've got a scenario here in which none of the ingredients was out of stock. So in the output, we don't really see any difference, right? Compared to the executor service one. But I mean, all meals have like four ingredients and there's a 5% chance. So like one once in ev every five or six runs, right? Something is out of stock. In this case, we are completely out of Parmigiano Reggiano cheese, so we cannot of course, we cannot serve carpaccio, right? That's just not possible. But carpaccio was picked for the starter. And what I see in the output here is that um, the waiters are talking to the chef, but the waiters never return to the customer to tell them, we are going to serve you with these meals. And it's because this instruction fails. So the other work that was scheduled is not even continued, it is cancelled because one of the subtasks um, is resulting in a failure. This is one of the benefits of using structured concurrency. And now the gentleman here on the fifth row asked me to call starter.get before the join, right? That is a good question. Um, start a course. So let's see what happens. There's an illegal state exception that says owner did not join after forking subtasks. So that's your answer. I, I like these questions the best, right? Let's just try it out and we'll see what happens. Sorry? One of the forks. So what if one of the forks throws an exception? Is that your question? Oh, if more than one throws an exception. Right, um, well, this scope is called shutdown and failure, and the behavior of the scope is if the first one fails, the entire scope will fail. So the fact that the second one will fail is kind of irrelevant then because it will already have been have failed at the first failure. Um, but I'll return to your question in a minute, but because it is relevant in uh, when we talk about custom scopes, right? Because these are the default scopes. Okay, so this is the code that we ended up with, and what we see is the shutdown on failure scope shuts down when the first subtask, subtask fails. Uh, this is a known pattern in concurrency that is also sometimes called invoke all. Um, a second uh, default scope exists. You might might have already seen it in the, the tooltip. It's called shutdown on success. I'll first demonstrate that one, and then we'll go on to talk about custom scopes a bit more. Um, the shutdown on success, actually, I, um, I was out with a few friends on a Friday night and we sat down at one of these bars and one of the waiters came down to us and said, what would you like to drink? And it was one of those places where they didn't have a menu that listed all the drinks. They just wanted the waiters to list the drinks like verbally, right? So I asked, what do you have in stock? And he started listing all these drinks. 
right? Beers and wines and, and soft drinks. And, and do you know that social awkwardness when you have heard the waiter say something you like, but you let him talk and talk and talk until he reaches the end of the list, and you're like, yeah, that first drink sounded really good, right? And he'll be annoyed, like, why did you let me continue my work for so long? Or, or even worse, when you're, when you're like, what was the first drink again? I kind of forgot that <laughs> they get even more annoyed. Well, this is a perfect example for shutdown on success, because the first drink that I hear that, that, is, that I like, that is according to my taste, I kind of want him to shut up and just bring me the drink already. Um, and shutdown on success is exactly what we need for this use case. So that means that we are going to extend our example and we're not going just to have a structured concurrency restaurant, but also a structured concurrency bar. And in order to use that, it's good, I think, to give you an example of how drink orders work. So a waiter can announce courses like you, see, like you saw before, but it can also get drink orders. It takes a guest, and that is relevant because a guest has a list of favorite drinks, right? So it's just a record with a name and a list of favorite drinks. So the waiter has to match the drinks that he announces to this list. And each waiter gets a list of categories to announce. So one waiter will announce all coffee and tea specialties. One waiter will announce the beers and the wines and the soft drinks, for example. And it's again statically typed here. There's a green drinks menu with a few beers, a few wines, cocktails, a lot of alcohol, not on purpose, by the way. Uh, soft drinks, coffees, teas, right? Just a small database here. Simple data, and he will, uh, he or she will go to through the drink categories, and uh, just wonder um, what drinks are on display today. This is a typo, so I fixed it there. Uh, listing drink is hard work, so it sleeps for a while. Then it formats the drink that it's offering, and if the guest likes the drink, the guest will respond, hey, I like this drink, so please order it for me, right? And if nothing is liked there, it will throw a, a guest doesn't like any of these drinks exception. So that is how that works. Let's create um, a main method again to run this code. And again, we can just replace it with a void main. new structured concurrency bar. By the way, I didn't show the bar interface, but it's very simple. It just determines the drink order for a guest. And a drink order has a guest and a drink, so it's kind of simple. Um, in order to use this example, we have to create a few guests. So imagine I am one of the guests. That means I also have to provide a list of drinks that I like. Well, I like espresso, which is in the coffee category, and I also like local favorite here. I presume a smaller dibble. Oh, that's ugly. Let's just static import everything. And um, let's assume I'm going here with my wife. She's called Rihanna. She doesn't like espressos at all. She needs a bit more milk in there. And she doesn't like beers. <laughs> I'm not complaining about, about my life, mind you. <laughs> or at least that wasn't the intention. She does like green teas. So uh, we have some green, green teas in the house, but I never touch them. Okay, so we are going to this bar, and the bar has to determine the right drink order for the both of us. And it throws an exception again. In this case, let's throw it, but in real life, never do that. So let's create the structured concurrency bar implementation. For that, we need to implement the determined drink order. 
And in this case, we are going to uh, employ two waiters. So today it is it is Zoe, and um, Elmo has recovered from his uh, enormous long working stint, so he's also available today to us. Again, we are going to create a structured task scope, but this time we are using uh, the shutdown shutdown on success, and as you can see, it's, it, it takes a generic type because the shutdown on success can immediately return its result. So we have to specify what type the result will be. And this probably goes here. <laughs> there we go. Let's hide the left side so it is readable again to us. We again call scope.fork. Oh, by the way, I have a shortcut for this as well. Announce drinks. There we go. It does mean I have to import some stuff again. I like that. So Zoe will announce all the beers, all the distilled spirits and the juices, and Elmo will announce wines, cocktails, coffees, and teas. And at the end of the try block, we return again scope.join, but in this case, we cannot call throw a field because that's a method on shutdown on failure. In this case, we call result, which just returns the result. And I think the name already gives it away, but the scope shuts down on success. So that means that if there's a one result from either of these two tasks, the scope will shut down and the rest of the work will be discarded. At least that's what I hope for this demo, but it should be. I have done Kotlin all week. Did I mention that? Okay. Ooh, a lot of stuff is being done here. So, Zoe is starting to list bears, right? Heineken, Hoogaarde, Westmalle Dubbel. But at the same time, Emmo is starting to list wines. Why well, I don't even like wine remotely. So, I don't respond to that, but I do respond to this one. And in between, Elmo comes with Bloody Mary. Then I say, hey, I like Vesmala Dibble. And Zoe says, ordering Vesmala Dibble for guest Hono. And as you can see, Elmo has barely finished the wine category and didn't even get to the other categories. And that is because the scope has shut down because there is a single result available now. So there's no need for this subtask to complete anymore because the result has been known. And when they get to my wife, it takes a bit longer, but eventually Elmo covers the coffee category and tells her cappuccino. Then she responds and the cappuccino is ordered and all the other work that's still in the queue is discarded because the result is already known to us. So that is the behavior of the um, shutdown on success scope. So it shuts down the scope and returns the result when the first subtask succeeds. And this pattern is also known as invoke any. And these are the two scopes that are uh, bundled with Java, but you can create your own if you want. Uh, you only have to extend the class structure task scope and implement the methods that are defined in that class, the abstract methods, uh, which is in this case handle complete and you can define your own behavior. For example, you could say, let's collect all the results that succeed and ignore all the results that fail. That's like a shutdown on success, but don't shut down on the first successful one. Keep um, collecting successful results and ignore everything that fails. That is a scope use case that you could implement yourself. Or the other way around, keep summarizing failing results and um, report on them when the scope is done, for example, or your own custom shutdown policies. So this allows you to have full control over when this scope shuts down, what results will be collected according to what you need yourself. Okay, 
I've come to my favorite part of this talk, and I've called this section the sanity check section. I always like it when a speaker presents some hot new feature that is supposedly supposed to solve everything. Uh, but I like it when speakers address the questions, these nagging questions that everyone must have, or at least the questions that I had when I researched uh, the subject. So I'll, I'll address the questions that I think most of you will have. And of course, still, if you have any questions less, uh, left, uh, call out or come see me after the talk. That's not, not a problem at all. Uh, so wait a minute. At least executive service allowed me to pass a thread configuration, right? F uh, fixed thread pool, uh, cache thread pool, virtual thread per task executor. It looks like structured concurrency doesn't support that at all. Well, it does support that. Uh, we have uh, until now uh, uh, used the structured task scope constructors with no arguments, so we've used the default constructors until now, but there's an overloaded constructor that takes a thread factory, and that means that you can pass a platform thread factory or a virtual thread factory there, so there is some configuration possible. However, by default, it will use a virtual thread factory. And that is a deliberate decision, because um, the Java language designers feel that structured concurrency performs best when you use a thread per request approach. And as we have already seen, virtual threads are just, just the tool for that. OK, so second sanity check. Why do we need all these new scope classes? Why didn't they just enhance the executive service interface to support structured concurrency? Um, well, that is because the new scope class supports and enforces structure and order. Um, and so it cannot implement the executor or the executor service interface because those interfaces use non-structured concurrency. Uh, so the reason is backward compatibility, right? We cannot uh, make this interface adhere to a different one when we cannot even support that type of concurrency. However, if you would want to start using structured concurrency, um, I think that the existing code, existing tasks that may benefit from adding structure will be very easy to migrate to use structured task scope. So I don't expect any problems there whatsoever. Executor service already supports invoke all and invoke any. Why would I still need structured concurrency? Well, this is true. Executor service does support these operations. These operations invoke all and invoke any. There's an invoke all that takes a collection of callables and returns a list of futures. And there's an invoke any that, again, takes a collection of callables but returns a result, the third result that completes successfully. So why do we need structured concurrency? Well, that's because there are differences. And the first reason is cancellation. Executor service dot invoke all doesn't support cancellation. The only thing it can do is wait until all tasks have finished, whether they are finished successfully or exceptionally. And I think it would be fun to demonstrate that for a bit so you can see it for yourself. Well, I had this question and I created a, an example to make sure that I understood the behavior. So, um, Let's see, we've got our structured concurrency restaurant here. And the use case that I have right now is I want the announcement of the starter course to always fail. How do I do that? Well, that's very simple. Just return a new runtime exception. No starters today. Right, so now everything, it will always fail every time. Oh, sorry. Throw the demo effect, thank you. <laughs> um, the semicolon should go here. There we go. Let's copy this because I want to also put that in the multi waiter executor service one. This one also fails every time we use it. Thank you. 
Of course, this doesn't compile anymore. This is kind of an ugly hack, but of course, th this will never have a result at all. So I'll just type in null here for now. And I think that must be wrong in the other one as well. Oh, I have to get rid of this one. OK. So I want to run both of them. Main restaurant, let's start off with the multi waiter executor service and run it. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Okay. <laughs> Interestingly, I don't even get an exception or anything in the log that is probably. Why is that? It doesn't really matter. The, the thing is, we don't see anything related to the starter. And that's, of course, uh, that's not a coincidence because it always throws an exception. But I do see the other two, quite consistently, the other two courses being announced, right? So there's no cancellation here. I think we, that it's a, a safe conclusion. And now let's see what Structured Concurrency Restaurant does. Well, it just throws the runtime exception, it says no starters today. So we don't see any output from the other tasks. So the cancellation is communicated. So yes, it is called invoke all for executor service, but it doesn't have any cancellation. So invoke all means run everything until either all tasks are successful or either all tasks are not successful and throw an exception or you know some somewhere in between. So to get this cancellation feature, you definitely need structured concurrency. And of course, if you feel like your workload is hierarchical in nature, if you're kind of building this hierarchy in your mind already and you want to express that in code, you cannot do that using executor service. So structured concurrency would then be a, a far better fit. And if you want to make the created task return to the same place, limit resource leaks in the process. That is also only a capability that structured concurrency can offer. Like we saw, custom shutdown policies and virtual threads by default. Of course, you can make executive servers use virtual threads as well. But uh, with structured concurrency, this is the default. Don't have to change anything about it. If you're interested in the comparison, there's a good article that I used for this talk. Make sure you check it out. Slide deck will also be online. I'll post a link in the final slide so you can click through them in your own time if you want. Sanity check again. I can just create multiple completable futures, right? And wrap them in a completable future all off. Why would I need structured concurrency? Well, actually, we did this already in one of the slides, showed you this code. Uh, the same reason that invoke all doesn't do everything structured concurrency does. There's no cancellation. You cannot create a task hierarchy. You cannot make the created tasks return to the same place. You cannot create custom shutdown policies. And no virtual threads by default because completable futures use the fork join pool by default. You can configure this, but it's, it's a hassle. And on top of that, completable future was designed for an asynchronous programming paradigm. Uh, structured task scope, structured concurrency, encourages the blocking paradigm. So it was designed to offer degrees of freedom that doesn't don't really work in structured concurrency. And when I was preparing this talk, I was confused all the time about the differences and the things that these three approaches have in common. So I thought it was beneficial to create a table and walk you through it through the differences. So the focus of executor service is thread pool management and task execution, right? And completable future then says, let's compose asynchronous operations and handle the eventual results in an asynchronous way. Structured concurrency says, let's run related tasks in a structured scope. So those are three very different focuses. You can get your work done with all three, but it, it's entirely dependent on the nature of the work that you submit to it. Chaining operations with executor servers, this is painful. Manual coordination with future, future objects, lots of blocking weights. Completable future is very uh, suited for this. Built-in methods like then apply that allow you to build this pipeline of chaining. Um, con uh, structured concurrency organizes tasks hierarchically and forces parent-child parent relationship 
between tasks. So it's a different form of chaining. Error handling. In executor service, you should do manual try catch blocks, run future get. The completable future has some handy methods to um, uh, handle all exceptions in a single place with exceptionally or when complete. And error handling with structured concurrency is mainly focused on the shutdown or failure scope like we saw just now. Timeout management with executor service, it's manual again, future.get timeout. Uh, completable future has the complete on timeout method. And with structured concurrency, I've used the join method until now that waits indefinitely until a result is available or until a failure occurs, but you can also pass this uh, a deadline. So a deadline after which it doesn't wait anymore. And of course a failure, then you should return a failure then of course. And then blocking versus non-blocking, I already mentioned it before. Executor service is blocking, completable future is non-blocking. And structured concurrency is blocking again. It blocks until first failure or the first success. I have used the table from building.com here as a basis, but I extended it a bit with structured concurrency. So if you're interested and want to read more, take a picture now or find the slides afterwards, that's also fine. Well, by this point, even Elmo isn't really sane anymore. Also, he is asking for a sanity check question. We already have fork join pool that also imposes structure on concurrent tasks. Why do I need structured concurrency? Uh, well, that is a good question, but fork join pool uh, imposes structure on compute intensive tasks, recursive problems, and structured concurrency specifically targets I.O. tasks, which is also the reason why virtual threads are enabled by default. So let's summarize. We've seen that virtual threads deliver an abundance of threads, millions of them if you want to, and structured concurrency is the, the good mechanism to correctly and robustly coordinate the millions of threads in a structured way, so they follow a hierarchy. And that means that it's now time to look into scoped values a bit. The next station that we visit in our concurrency journey. And scoped values are being developed alongside structured concurrency. They are both part of Project Loom, uh, but they've also had the same preview statuses until now. I expect them to become final in the same Java release again, because they go so well together. And let's remind ourselves of the problem that we're trying to solve here. So we talked about thread locals before. They can make sure that values unique to the thread can be passed around without using method signatures. Uh, they are an elegant way to bind data that is unique to the current thread, but they are also always mutable. We don't like that. They have an unbounded lifetime. As long as the thread is active, we don't like that. And they can be memory intensive especially with many threads or when inherited. And scope values are um, an answer to these pros and cons. So in essence, in essence, a scoped value is a value unique to a thread that may be safely and efficiently shared to methods without using method parameters. So they can effectively be an implicit method parameter, like every method in a sequence of calls has an additional invisible parameter. This reminds us of thread locals, of course, because their purpose seemed similar. But there are also a few improvements because scoped values are immutable. They are written once and they can be read multiple times after that. They are comprehensible because they have a limited lifetime, which is made visible from the syntactic structure of code. Right with a thread local, you could never know for sure where it was used. With a scoped value, it is confined to a literal syntax block in your code. Scope values are robust because data shared by a caller can only be retrieved by legitimate colleagues. And it will become a lot clearer when we look at uh, the form they present themselves in. This is how they look with a bit of um, pseudo, pseudo code. So a scoped value can be created by calling scope value.new instance like here, and it's again a wrapper type around uh, an, an object, a class, in this case a string, but it can be anything. And to start off, 
the passing of a scoped value, you can call the where method, scoped value.where, then you define the key of the scoped value, in this case it's just the variable, and the value to bind to the scoped value. And then afterwards, you perform some action. And there are multiple methods here. In this case, we have used run because you pass a runnable, but there's also call when you call pass the callable, right? So, but the, the mechanism is the same. And this means that the value hello that is bound to the scoped value x is available throughout this lambda here, this runnable. And because we're calling the bar method for the entirety of the bar method, it is allowed to call x.get and that will, in this case, print hello. So that's the general idea. I think it's now time to migrate our announcement IDs from thread locals to scoped values and see how this mechanism would work in our restaurant interface. Okay, so for that we return to our, our announcement ID class, which currently looks like this. Right, um, we will still need the atomic integer, but we probably don't need that local anymore. We do need a scoped value, of course. Private static final scoped value of, of integer. And let's call scoped value dot new instance. So we've populated that with a new instance. I there's there's one thing with scoped values that we need that is different than before. We are we need to be able to refer to this scoped value from from other classes because otherwise we cannot build the scope. So I'm going to create a method that. Um, returns the scoped value to the callee. Let's just simply call it scoped value as if this is a record accessor return announcement ID. And we also need a method. Um, I'm going to call, oh, we already have a get method. Then we need a method called next ID, public static int next ID. And we'll just use the atomic integer that we had before get an increment, it's still initial value is one, so the behavior will still be the same. And the get method here is just a shorthand for calling scoped value dot get, so that the code is a, a bit less verbose. And the only thing that then remains here is to return to both our waiter and our chef class. And, um, Oh, that's uh, that's a good thing. Of course, the announcement ID dot get method is automatically now referring to the scoped value, so we don't need to change that. But we do need to start off the scope here, and we are using the scoped value in the announce method, like you can see here, and if I recall correctly, also here in pick course. So that means that for the entirety of this announce method, we want the scoped value to be in scope. Well, we can do that, for example, uh, here. So instead of returning announce course type, we can simply return scoped value dot where announcement ID dot scoped value. Uh, this is the key. Now we need the value of this code value, which is announcement ID. Sorry, announcement ID dot next int. <laughs> oh, sorry. And we are going to pass a callable because it will return something. So we are using the method call, and this will just return the result of announce course type. So for this scope the value is available to us. I'm not sure what our main restaurant is doing right now. Probably something that I don't want, right? Let's reinstate the starters. There we go. 
And if our announcement IDs are working, and they are, that means that we are now using scoped values. So the behavior is exactly the same. Or is it? I mean, <laughs> if we would return to our uh, waiter class and try to access this scoped value uh, before we started the scope. This will be entirely possible with a thread local, right? But the scope value says no such element exception. There is no scope value in this, this place in the code. Um, and also, if we would use it, do it here, far course. Also, if we would do it after the scope is ended, no such element exception. So this is an example of how um, how the scoped value enforces the use of the scoped value within the scope. It cannot be accessed outside of the scope. And this is vastly different from what the thread local, how the thread local behaved until now. Right, so we saw in the code that this is the scope that we have defined. And for the entirety of the announce method, the scoped value is available to us. And this is where we actually use the values. And the pick course method also. So this also means because pick course is called in announce, it is also part of the scope. And that is why this line of code also works. So I said that scoped values are immutable, and they are. But that doesn't mean that they cannot be uh, rebound. So it's possible to rebind scoped values, but it is in, a, in an immutable way. I've taken the code example from the JEP 446 as an example. So um, we've defined a scoped value here called x. We bound it to hello. And for the entirety of the bar method, x refers to hello. So when we do x.get on line 8 and x.get on line 10, it prints hello. But in between, we bind a different value to the same scope value key. We bind the string goodbye to the scope value x. For the scope of the BAS method, which is this one, means for the scope for of the BAS method, it will print, well, won't print hello, but it will print goodbye. So it can be rebound, but it doesn't mean that it's mutable. It's just, just as a different value for a tighter scope. And you can see when it returns to the scope above, it will still have the old value that it had before. So that's one thing that you can do with scoped values. And on top of that, you can also inherit scoped values, um, just like with inheritable thread locals. But there is no copying involved to the child thread. So this memory intensity issue can also be solved by using scoped values. For example, if we would introduce a scoped value drink order ID in our drink determine drink order code, we bind uh, the integer 1 to drink order ID, then within this entire method, this entire method, or sorry, within this lambda expression, we could refer to the drink order ID and call get on it. Uh, but by default, um, by default, if you spawn any child threads from this scope, the scope value would not be accessible there. However, if you combine it, if you combine it with structure concurrency like we've done here, it is possible to refer to them in the threads that are launched here. So the threads that are created here on line 12 and 13, well at least by uh, the structure concurrency construct, they do have access to the scoped values that we defined there on line number nine. Um, legacy threat management constructs like fork join pool or executive service, they cannot support inheritance like this because they cannot guarantee that a child thread that is forked from a scope uh, will exit before the scope is finished, right? And that's now, that's exactly one of the characteristics of structured task scopes, that they can guarantee that after the scope of the structured task scope is finished, that all threads are done with their work. That also means that you gain safety for these uh, scoped values and that they can have exactly the same scope as the tasks that are started up here. So it's very nice to see that two features from the same project and that, that are somewhat related can work so closely together and uh, make use of their features and interact with each other. 
So I, I really like that very much. So then comes uh, the question, when should you migrate? So if you're in a project right now, and you're using thread locals, should you migrate through to scoped values? Are they always a better choice or just in certain situations? Well, here's my advice for you. I think you should migrate only when your thread locals deal with one-way transmission of unchanging data. And that means that you use your thread locals to set a value once and then read it many times. Because scoped values are immutable, right? Uh, and if you expect to use many virtual threads, because the fact that more threads can be available to us also means that thread local, th using thread locals poses a slightly higher risk. If you're not u intending to use virtual threads at all, I wouldn't see the benefit in migrating. So that is why I've placed on the slide here, don't migrate when your th thread local is used in a two-way fashion, lots of reading, but also lots of writing and lots of places, then it will become very difficult to migrate that to a scoped value because the setting of the values is the problem here. Or don't migrate when you don't expect to use virtual threads. Thread locals are still supported for platform threads and for virtual threads, it's probably working as well. It's just that from a Java perspective, uh, it's advisable to couple them with scoped values if you can. So to summarize, thread locals don't limit mutability. And we've seen that they perform badly with many virtual threads and scoped values support immutable val values come with a strictly defined lifetime and can be inherited efficiently through structured concurrency. Okay, so we're nearing the finish line of the talk. And one question I always like to ask myself about some new feature or new techno technological advancement is how will this impact the day-to-day -day life of a Java programmer? So this is a small section that is targeted towards that question. How will this feature change your day-to-day -day life? Of course, that depends on the role you currently have in your job. So if you're a trainer or a developer advocate like me, just get started trying them out, talking about them like I'm doing right now, and uh, help, help other people get used to them and teach, teach them about it. If you're working on a framework or a library yourself, um, you can start using the features, right? To enhance your product and see what, what challenges there are and what opportunities there are to use a new technology. Um, but also be aware of the fact that uh, structured concurrency and scope values are still in preview, right? Most of the times that means that there are only minor changes to the Java announcement proposals until they become finalized, but once in a while, one of these proposals will, uh, will, will be removed from the JDK and redesigned, like, for example, what happened with string templates in Java 22 because it's not in Java 23 anymore and it's undergoing a huge redesign right now. And if you've come to rely on these fairly new APIs and there's a giant redesign, that will break things at your end. So keep in mind that only virtual threats is the feature that's finalized and the other two are still being worked on. But they are nearing the finish line, that is for sure. So keep in mind, they are not permanent parts of, parts of the language, but hopefully they will be soon. Okay, when you're using a Java application framework, like Spring, for example, you rarely create threads yourself, right? It is in almost in every situation, it's better to let the framework handle the concurrency. So it's important to know how you can configure the framework that you're using to benefit from the new concurrency features. So this is how you can use virtual threads with Spring. As you may know, as a Spring developer, uh, you would probably use the simple task executor type that is available for you. And uh, starting from Spring 6.1, um, there is uh, this set virtual threads method that takes a Boolean. So you can just define a Spring task executor bean, call this method, and it will start using virtual threads by default. Um, keep in mind, like any new technology, that you test drive it for a bit, don't push it to production just yet, right? Create a branch and uh, see how it behaves and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
but sure, you can try try it out and see how your how your logic works with that. Of course, we're not all Spring developers, so what if you're in a Jakarta EE environment? Uh, well, if you are, you are probably used to managed beans in your application container, and you will probably already use a managed executor service like here with the resource annotation. If you replace that one by the managed executor definition annotation with the same JNDI lookup, but with the virtual set to true, the managed executor service from Jakarta EE will also run on virtual threads. And this is important with Jakarta EE because you want your application container to know about the threads that you create in case of shutdowns in situations that you didn't predict or something. Uh, furthermore, this is also exciting. Jakarta E also um, is also capable of running structured concurrency already because that's just uh, a question of um, calling the overloaded structured task scope uh, constructor because you can pass a thread factory to it. So if you make sure that this variable is populated with a managed thread factory that is known to the application container, your Jakarta EE server, then it is entirely possible to start using it already. And if you're working in a Quarkus project, I found this annotation that I think is very useful, the run on virtual thread annotation, which can make sure that any method that you annotate with it runs on a virtual thread. I've also seen examples where methods annotated with this annotation also started up structured concurrency scopes. So there's a lot of experimentation already going on. So you should definitely try that out and see how that uh, runs and how that performs. Um, bottom line is you can start using this stuff right away, uh, regardless of what framework you're using. Um, keep in mind if you're using managed uh, environments like Jakarta E or Spring, that it's important to use the right configuration methods so that your EE container or your Spring context knows what you're, what you're doing. And of course, with any t topic that is about improvements, the question may arise, have we come to journey's end? Are we there yet with Java concurrency? I think this is also a rhetorical question. I mean, I don't think we're never there. Um, and that there are always things to work on. Uh, these, are, these are a few things that I think will be worked on in the future, uh, or at least stuff that I read about in the enhancement proposals. Uh, so, uh, one of the JEPs uh, specific, specifically stated that they were looking into sharing streams of data among threads. Um, they called this construct channels, so a new way of sharing data between threads, co coordinate data. Um, there was a remark in the JEP about structured concurrency that said we might propose a way to support this in the future, so that is one possibility of where Java concurrency is heading. Second thing that was mentioned in the JEP, JEP 453, to be precise, is a new thread cancellation mechanism. So the current mechanism to cancel or interrupt threads by catching interrupted exceptions, notifying log objects, has been around for a long time. And the Java language designers stated in the JEP that they might propose to um, change this, or at least propose a new thread cancellation mechanism. No details yet, this is just what was said in the JEP. And finally, this is something that I think everyone could feel coming when I talked about it, solving thread pinning when virtual threads are executing a synchronized code block. Uh, there are plans to make sure that this isn't needed anymore. For native methods, it's not really possible or feasible to do, but for synchronized methods, they are thinking of uh, adding modifications to support that. So um, I'm, I'm curious to see how that will develop and I will try to keep in mind um, and blog about it, write about it if something becomes available. So if you're interested, uh, follow along with me. I would like to start off with the final slide and then go to the any questions that are still in the audience to give everyone uh, a chance to take a photo or uh, get to the resources um, that I've prepared for you. So the slides are available on my website via the link there. 
And if you want to play with the code that I demoed, you can start using it yourself, using that GitHub project. If you like what I told you and are, are eager to learn more about other subjects, I got a question about version control systems, for example. That's very cool. Uh, follow me along on hano.code or at hanotify on any social media you like. I would be happy to keep in touch, answer any questions asynchronously even, if that's uh, your thing. Um, I think everyone got a good chance to take pictures, so if there are any questions left, I would be happy to take them. So please go ahead. Yes. Sorry, the, the, the queue mechanisms? The channels. I mean, uh, yeah. it's, it seems to me a normal queue. Uh, is there any different mechanism that they have in mind? Yeah, so the question is, the channels seem to resemble normal queue. Is there any difference? Uh, I can't answer the question. Uh, the Jeb just said, we're looking into a new mechanism to coordinate data between threads. Well, let's call it channels. We might propose them in the future. So I'm eager to learn more, just as you are. Okay. I, I okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, well, if any more turn up, come see me after the talk or find me online. Thank you very much for sticking with me for the full two and a half hours. Thanks. <laughs>